everyone keeps secrets. But no one better than Seagal Awad. Among her friends, secrets with surprising twists. Hidden from her husband, unspoken secrets of betrayal. Shared secrets of the heart about lovers. And untold secrets between mother and daughter. But Seagal Awad learned one lesson too late. It's the secret that you don't tell anyone that can kill you. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Calgary, Alberta, 1992. A young Ethiopian woman has been murdered in her apartment. Detectives Nick Kiska and Wayne Lowinger arrive at the crime scene. A uniformed officer is speaking with the victim's husband. His name is Shakeb Mohammed. One hour ago, he discovered the body of his wife, Sagal Awad, in one of the bedrooms. She was kind of on her side, and uh, the face was uh, away from the doorway facing the wall. And uh, there was a uh, ligature, what appeared to be an electrical cord that had been tightly wrapped around her neck. Some of her braids are trapped beneath the cord. Beads are scattered on the carpet. It kind of indicates that uh, during the course of placing the ligature around the neck, there was a struggle. The cord has been ripped from a clock radio so violently that only a stub remains. There are scratch marks on her neck, blood on her mouth and nose. Seagal has been attacked violently, but there is no sign of sexual assault. Detective Kiska spots something strange on the floor. A small scrap of paper. Written on it is the victim's address. Aside from the murder scene, the rest of the apartment is tidy, undisturbed. It appears nothing has been stolen. We didn't find any indication that the apartment door had been forced, uh, leading us to the conclusion that either the door was open or that the victim, in fact, knew uh, the person. Kiska's partner, Detective Lowinger, questions Seagal's husband, who appears emotionless. We started to talk to the husband to try and gather information about uh, his wife and how the partic that particular day had gone so that we could begin to do our investigation. According to the husband, that morning Seagal prepared their daughter for daycare. He and Seagal usually attended half-day English classes together. But Seagal said she had a doctor's appointment so would not be going. He left at 8.15. He claims it was the last time he saw his wife alive. He had indicated to us that he had, had gone to school. He left school and he began to wander the downtown core. The husband's English class ended at noon, but he says he didn't return home until five. And that's when he found his wife's body and called police. Detective Lowinger is suspicious. He doesn't appear to be coming real clean about where he's been and what his activities are. So the red flags run up. He spent the whole afternoon alone, didn't talk to anyone. So he has no alibi and he shows no grief. Normally a husband would have some emotion. This man didn't show any, none, not a tear, nothing. Police bag the husband's clothes for forensic analysis, hoping to find traces of his wife's blood on them. Then they take him to the station for further questioning. A pathologist is called to the scene to help police fix a time of death. But the air conditioning has been on all day. It's enough of a factor to make it difficult to pinpoint an exact time. 
the only conclusion is that Seagal was killed in the afternoon. But the pathologist makes one important discovery. There was some bits of fleshy material in her fingernails. Seagal may have scratched her attacker. If so, the killer's DNA will be found under her nails. Police preserve the evidence and send the body for autopsy. The next day, detectives Kiska and Lowinger go door to door within the tight-knit Ethiopian community. They need to learn more about the life of Seagal and her husband. The best way to profile the husband, the victim, um, their relationship is to speak with people who they commonly associate with. News of the murder has spread through the community. People are shocked, but they offer little help to police. No one really knew the couple. Finally, the detectives get a break. They meet a cab driver named Samatar, who says he was a friend of Seagal's. He still can't believe she's dead. He tells detectives they met as students in the same English language class, and they often had coffee together. The detectives question him about the victim and her husband. He says theirs was an arranged marriage, as is the custom among many Ethiopians. But he's not sure how happy they were together. At the morgue, the autopsy is performed by Dr. John Butt. Well, the conclusion in this case was that she died as a result of asphyxia and it was due to ligature strangulation. What about the flesh under her fingernails? It was her own flesh from her neck. This is not uncommon in a homicidal ligature strangulation. The victim is trying to slacken the, the device around her neck, so she tries to get her hands underneath it. It's a dead end. There's no biological evidence that can lead to Seagal's killer. Two days after the murder, the detectives return to Seagal's apartment to understand more about the victim's world. It appeared that he was living in the master bedroom and that she was occupying the secondary bedroom. We started to realize that the victim and her husband were almost living two separate lives within the same apartment. On the top shelf in Seagal's bedroom, police find a traveling bag. It's packed with her clothes, as if she were ready to leave on a trip. And under the clothes, a jewelry case, locked. We ultimately broke into the case, and uh, it was uh, kind of like opening Pandora's box. It contains a bundle of letters. Airmail letters that had been mailed from Rome, Italy, addressed to the, the victim. Although some of the letters were very current, none of them bore the address of where she lived. There was actually a different address on the envelopes. The letters are handwritten in Amharic, the language of Ethiopia. Police will have to get the letters translated. In the box, the detective also finds one single picture taken in Rome. It was a photograph depicting the, the victim, uh, an unidentified male, and uh, someone that uh, we, we were sure was uh, our cabbie. Why didn't Samatar the cabbie tell them about being with Seagal in Rome? Who is the other man in the picture? And what does the husband know about all this? Less than 48 hours ago, the lifeless body of Seagal Awad was discovered, sprawled across her bedroom floor. Police already have two suspects, Seagal's husband and a cab driver who may have been more than a friend to Seagal. Detective Kiska goes to the address written on the letters found in Seagal's closet. It's the home of Miriam Shaheen, a good friend of Seagal's. Why did the letters to the victim come here? She told us that her address was used by the victim and that uh, the letters were, uh, she characterized them as love letters from someone the victim was acquainted with back in Rome. Miriam has been covering for Seagal, who had an affair in Italy with a man named Mustafa Musa. 
Seagal met Mustafa in Rome, where she lived for a year while her husband was establishing residency in Canada. Miriam tells the detective that Seagal was madly in love with Mustafa. He had written her every week since she joined her husband in Calgary three months ago. The detective shows her the photo. Although she doesn't know the man in the sunglasses, Miriam identifies Mustafa as the man with the dreadlocks. Could Seagal's husband have found out about this love affair? Has Mustafa been here to see her? We made some inquiries with, with Canada Immigration, and we determined that no one under that name had uh, either made application for entry to Canada or had, in fact, arrived in Canada. Mustafa can't be of any help to police until they can find him in Italy. But Samatar, the cab driver, is going to have to answer some tough questions. He has lied to police about his relationship with Seagal. The photograph puts him in Rome with her. What other secrets is he keeping from police? We confronted him with the photo, and he just told us that that wasn't him. It was, it was someone that looked like him. The cabbie swears it's a coincidence. He's never been to Rome. He doesn't even know the two men in the picture. Kiska is not convinced. He demands to know where Samatar was the day of the murder. The cabbie can't believe he's a suspect. He was working that day. And besides, he would never have hurt Seagal. She was too precious to him. He reveals he was more than a friend. He was her confidant. Although he may not have used these words himself, it became apparent that he was uh, in love with, with the woman, but that those feelings weren't shared by her. So he was definitely in, in the suspect pool. Is it possible that frustrated love drove the cabbie to commit murder? While Detective Kiska leaves to check out Samatar's alibi, Detective Lowinger has been trying to confirm the husband's story. We tried to establish a husband's alibi. He told us he left the school, he walked a distance. It took him a certain period of time to do that. We did time that walk from point A to point B, and we weren't able to come up with the same kind of times he was, he was giving us. He says he stops for coffee at a coffee place. Um, no one remembers him there. We tried to establish the fact that he was actually at school that day and couldn't clearly determine that. We couldn't find any evidence to support what he was saying in any way, shape, or form. Only one part of the husband's story checks out. Seagal did have a doctor's appointment on the day she was murdered. Detective Kiska pays a visit to the clinic. The doctor is reluctant to discuss one of her patients, even with the police. But she lets Kiska read Seagal's file. He learns that Seagal was here for a checkup. She recently had an abortion. Did Seagal come alone to the clinic? No, she was with a man. And not her husband, she was with the cabbie. Once again, the detective confronts Samatar. The cabbie says Seagal swore him to secrecy about the abortion. But now that it's out in the open, Samatar tells the whole story. He started to tell us that she wasn't in love with her husband, that she was seeking something far better than, than uh, what she had at that particular time, and that her husband had no idea that she was pregnant. Samatar says she wanted to leave her husband and her loveless marriage, and having a child would tie her down. Kiska is confused. She was already tied down. She and her husband have a daughter. But the cabbie reveals that the daughter is not theirs. She's an orphan they brought to Canada to speed up their immigration claim. Kiska's beginning to believe the cabbie has been truthful all along. So he asks Samatar for a favor. He wants to attend the private reception following Seagal's funeral to meet any other friends and family. He thinks that people will speak more openly with Samatar at his side. Detective Lowinger remains outside watching who comes and goes. Only one person is missing, Seagal's husband. I wasn't sure up until the point he doesn't show up for the funeral. That lack of concern uh, on his part told me that I think this is the right guy. The detectives have two theories. Either the husband discovered that Seagal had an abortion against his wishes, 
or he found out about her affair with Mustafa and caught her leaving with her bags packed. Six days after Segal's murder, the results of the forensic tests on the husband's clothes come in. Negative. No blood at all. Police have motive and opportunity, but no hard proof. Yet, they can't arrest the husband. The next day, Miriam calls the detective over to her apartment. She's been translating the letters he left with her. She's found something that Segal kept secret, even from her. Segal was already pregnant in Italy. Father of her child wasn't her husband. It was Mustafa. It was very apparent that the author of the letters was deeply in love with the victim, that he was uh, very excited about the fact that she was expecting uh, his child, and that they would ultimately uh, be together at, at some point in time. At Kiska's request, Miriam calls a phone number in Rome, found for Mustafa in one of the letters. Miriam is informed that Mustafa is not in Italy. He's in Canada and has been for almost two weeks. It's been eight days since Segal Awad was found murdered. Detective Kiska wants to speak with her lover, Mustafa, but he has no idea where he is until he receives a surprising call from Toronto police. I was told that uh, they had attended a disturbance. Two male occupants of this particular residence were involved in some kind of a fight or altercation that one of those uh, individuals is likely responsible for the death of a woman in Calgary. Kiska takes the very next flight to Toronto. At the police station, Kiska interviews one of the two men taken into custody. It's Mahmoud, Segal's uncle, whom Kiska met at the funeral in Calgary. Mahmoud explains that Mustafa Musa came to stay with him two weeks ago. But during the past week, Mustafa has been saying strange things about Segal. Last night, Mustafa said he might have killed her. Stunning news. It still didn't make him a killer, but I would say that we were uh, at least as much interested in, in him than we were in, in the husband. The detective finally meets face to face with Segal's secret lover, Mustafa Musa. He claims he has nothing to hide, although he admits he did enter the country with a false passport. He confirms he is the man in the photo taken in Rome. The other man in the sunglasses is a cousin. And yes, he did write the letters to Segal. He loved her. But when Kiska asks about his confession to the uncle, Mustafa denies ever making one. The uncle is confused and emotionally upset. The interrogation lasted several hours. And then kind of during the course of that, he introduced this piece of paper and said, whose writing is this? Kiska shows Mustafa the handwritten note found at the crime scene with the victim's address on it. He readily admitted that it was, it was his writing. So, I mean, that was very significant because it, it tied him directly to the, to the crime scene. But Mustafa swears he's never been to Calgary. Kiska thinks he's lying, but has no hard evidence to the contrary. And of course, there were some big gaps because I couldn't provide him with the information as to how he got there, how he returned to Toronto, or any of those things. I think his parting words were, prove it. Kiska intends to prove it. He arrests Mustafa and flies him to Calgary. The arrest is big news. Police release a photo of the suspect in hopes that someone can place him in Calgary around the time of the murder. They get just one tip. And once again, it comes from the cabbie, Samatar. A friend of his recognized the picture of Mustafa in the newspaper. He met Mustafa on a flight from Toronto to Calgary on July 8th, two days before the murder. Mustafa had nowhere to stay, so the cabbie's friend offered him a bed. He was up very early, and uh, they were sitting around in the kitchen, and he asked how he would find a particular address. It was the morning of July 10th, the day of the murder. 
and the address was Seagal's. With this revelation, police finally have the last piece of the puzzle. This is what police believe happened the afternoon of July 10th. Seagal was alone in the apartment after returning from her doctor's appointment. She had packed her belongings and was ready to leave her husband and her daughter. Then, a knock at the door. But Seagal wasn't expecting anyone. Least of all, Mustafa. I'm sure that he expected that she would abandon her marriage and that they would uh, kind of live happily ever after. But Seagal had no such plans. Mustafa expected her to be pregnant with his child and discovered she'd had an abortion. She had changed her mind. In a rage, he strangled her to death. He didn't notice that he had dropped his handwritten note, leaving behind a most crucial piece of evidence. It was this note and his love letters to Seagal found in the first hours of the investigation which led police to Mustafa. Seagal had many secrets, but she kept only one to herself. She wanted to start a new life on her own terms with no man to tie her down. And when that secret finally came out, it cost her her life. Mustafa Musa was found guilty of second degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Just as a perfect diamond is rare, rarer still is the perfect crime. But one October morning, it happens. It's well organized, the thieves in full disguise. Split second timing, exquisite taste, and in less than two minutes, they have their prize. $1.2 million in jewelry, one of the biggest heists in Canadian history. And then, they vanish into thin air. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Vancouver, 1986. Police are on the scene of a jewel heist in minutes. But the terrified staff can't tell them much about the robbers. They were in full disguise. They knew exactly which counters to hit, only those with valuable jewelry. The robbery happened in broad daylight. And yet nobody saw the thieves run out of the mall. Police don't have much to go on. But in a back corridor, police find their first clues. The robber's disguises and a shotgun. It takes time to trace the gun. It isn't registered to a Vancouver owner. Instead, the gun is tracked to a recent theft half a continent away, in Ottawa. The gun is sent to Ottawa detectives Ralph Heyerhoff and George Snyder. The shotgun was a sawed-off uh, shotgun. The serial number was not uh, filed off. It was still intact. And ironically enough, at that time, I was investigating a break-in in the west of Ottawa where the shotgun had been stolen from. It matched up with the serial numbers. Hirehoff is convinced that whoever stole the gun here must be connected to the heist in Vancouver. But is the story that simple? I knew I had to find the guy who did the break and enter. The detectives have years of first-hand experience with the Ottawa criminal underworld. Luckily, Detective George Snyder is a walking encyclopedia of local criminals. Well, my specialty when I came to this case was street informants. 
Um, there was nobody that I arrested that I did not try to turn. And by turn, uh, I tried to get information out of them. One of those informants told them who had stolen the gun. It takes detectives a while to chase down the thief, one of the busiest break and enter artists in town, Lefty Williams. He's used to negotiating with police. He's got a long rap sheet, but he knows they won't arrest him for just stealing the gun if he gives them the information they're looking for. He says he doesn't know anything about a heist in Vancouver. All he knows is that he sold the gun to a major player in town, someone known as the big man. It was weeks ago when Lefty took the gun to a strip club. But he tells police that the big man never dirties his hands with any illicit transactions. He has others to do that work. He's got a good right-hand man who looks after all the details. Lefty says he was paid in drugs and some cash. But after that, he has no idea what happened to the gun. Police know the big man very well. He's a kingpin in the Ottawa criminal underworld. A guy who receives and sells stolen property a fence. They've been trying to get evidence on him for years. He's uh, connected to the criminal underworld in Ottawa probably better than almost everybody. Um, if you were looking for a gun to do a job, you could go to him and get a gun. If you were looking for an accomplice, you could go to him and he would connect you with somebody that would be your accomplice on the job and he would also take care of uh, the product after you brought it back. If the big man fenced the shotgun used in the Vancouver jewelry heist, there's a good chance he moved the stolen goods as well. He was moving as much uh, stolen property as Sears was moving legitimate property, but there was literally nothing we could do about it. Police would have to catch the big man with the hot property in order to arrest him. But they know this guy's a smooth operator. He and the jewelry store bandit would have worked out a tight turnaround and the jewels would be long gone by now. He's a professional. Being a criminal was his business. He understood that being a police officer was your business. He respected you. Uh, he expected you to show respect to him and um, game on. Police review the case files of eight major jewelry store robberies over the past three years, right across the country. They discover all have the same modus operandi as in the Vancouver heist. Disguises, guns, split-second timing, and invisible getaways. The Burke's jewelry chain is their favorite target. And again, everything starts falling into place. Uh, the light bulbs start going on and start realizing it's all connected. They surmise there must be one mastermind behind all this, someone bigger than the big man. Sometimes with an accomplice, sometimes working alone. And then, one morning, Hirehoff and Snyder receive some shocking news. A jewelry store robbery is underway right in their own backyard. The detectives race to the store to catch the jewel thieves in a downtown mall. But if this heist is the work of the same mastermind, they'll be too quick for police. The mastermind and his accomplice have pulled off a perfect robbery. No gun left behind this time. Ironically enough, we had a police uh, crime stopper event going on uh, at that time. It was pretty bold and brazen to go up three floors and rob the largest jewelry store in the mall, and then these guys took off. By the time police arrive, the bandits have walked away with $180,000 in estate jewelry. Whoever the mastermind is, he's a pro's pro, and he's probably already planning his next heist. Detectives George Snyder and Ralph Heyerhoff are still one step behind the mastermind of several jewelry store robberies. He's just disappeared with 180 grand in jewelry. 
Odds are, he'll unload the goods through the most notorious fence in town, the big man. He was well known for jewelry. He, he, he likes jewelry, he would wear a lot of jewelry, and was very, very knowledgeable about jewelry. It was a bit of a fetish with him. It was, it was his trademark. So we started to just focus all of our attention on who was around the club. If the bandit is working with the big man, he will eventually have to make contact with him. But no one suspicious appears outside the club. Only Jimmy Risley, the longtime bouncer. He's the big man's right-hand man. We began an intensive surveillance of him and his activities. If the jewelry is moving through the club, Jimmy's the guy who will do the transactions. Following him might lead police to the bandit. But he's very surveillance conscious and good at smelling out cops. was very adept at uh, tricking us and, and getting so that he was basically chasing the surveillance team instead of us chasing him. The fact that he was willing to chase us, I thought that was interesting. It was scary at first, and then I thought, wow, this, this is pretty neat and pretty bold. He's not afraid of us. I knew this was pointless. Uh, the surveillance stuff wasn't going to work, so we had to go to the, the direct approach. He knows we're there. Let's just go meet the guy and talk to him. I invited him to join me for breakfast right across the street so I could uh, have a conversation with him. He, uh, he failed to show up, which did not surprise me. Suspecting that Jimmy's still in his apartment, the detectives used the super's key to surprise him. Jimmy might be smart, but he's also extremely claustrophobic. Detectives question him about the jewelry store heists, but he's not in a cooperative mood. He's a very hyper guy, very active guy, very animated. His hands were going, his head would be going, his feet would be going all the time. He, he couldn't sit still at all. Jimmy's not giving them what they need. They remind him there's a warrant out for him on a recent break and enter. They threaten to arrest him on the spot. This guy definitely did not want to go back to jail. I mean, he really, really didn't have much of a choice. He, he was going to have to cooperate or do a substantial amount of jail time. I asked him, what do you know about the Burks Bandit? He wouldn't give me a straight answer, but he said, well, there's a new guy around. I don't really know his name. I don't know much about him. I think he's an American. A few days later, Heyerhoff spots someone matching the description of the new guy. Heyerhoff runs the license plate. The guy's name is Robert Whiteman, and he lives in Pembroke, a town an hour outside of Ottawa. We were very experienced seasoned police officers, and, and we knew the majority of the main players in town. We did not know this guy. So for now, the police are going to just watch him. Inside the club, Detective Snyder sees Whiteman flashing cash. But that's not illegal. In fact, he just seems like some guy who likes strip clubs. Although he's suspiciously friendly with the big man. Detectives travel to Pembroke, where Robert Whiteman has lived with his girlfriend for the past couple of years. He was a middle-aged gentleman with a, a young family. Not the sort of person that you would be thinking was a criminal at all, just very, very average. He worked for his father's security company, moving money around and also doing uh, background checks of uh, businesses for their security. Whiteman appears to be clean. He has no criminal record. It may just be another dead end for police, but then, from a routine analysis of Robert Whiteman's bank and credit card records, document specialist Mel Robertson discovers something astounding. We started looking at his, uh, his uh, banking statements, 
And as a result of that, we came across the, uh, the gold mine. We found that he was, we could put him through the use of his banking cards where the robberies had happened. Robertson sees that every time a major jewelry store was robbed, Whiteman was in that city using his credit card. Well, I think the most exciting moment was when we recognized that he had purchased a meal using that credit card the day of the Burke shop in Vancouver, dining right across the street. Police now believe that contrary to all appearances, Robert Whiteman could be the master jewel thief they've been looking for. But in order to prove it, they need to nab Whiteman with the goods. And that's not easy, because jewelry is fenced within hours. Once again, police turn to Jimmy the Bouncer for information. One of the goals that I had was to try to get him to forecast a job so that he would tell us in advance when a job was going down. Our investigation had shown that uh, Mr. Whiteman was flying all over Canada, and that wherever he flew, jobs went down. Jimmy doesn't know about any future jobs, but he does say that just yesterday, he and the big man were talking. When Whiteman drove up and started bragging about pulling a heist in Winnipeg the day before. Winnipeg police confirmed Jimmy's story. An armed robbery was carried out yesterday by a man in disguise. Early the next morning, the detectives returned to Pembroke. We were left with no alternative. So the, the only approach at that time was then the direct approach. Speak to him, see what he has to say maybe get something out of that. Whiteman's girlfriend says he's not home. He had to leave suddenly on business. She adds that maybe they can still catch him at the Pembroke airport. The detectives can't believe it. They have surveillance in place at the Ottawa airport, but... None of us were from Pembroke, and uh, none of us realized that there was an airport in Pembroke. Once again, they are one step behind. Our first concern was that he has spotted our surveillance. He's figured out the heat is on and he's flown the coop. Or he might be on his way to another robbery and they'll be too late to stop him. By the time detectives Snyder and Heyerhoff arrive at the local Pembroke airport, suspected master jewel thief Robert Whiteman has literally flown the coop. Fortunately for us, we decided that maybe let's investigate him leaving. Let's assume that maybe he's gone for another job. Detective Heyerhoff discovers that Whiteman has chartered a small plane to a city one hour away. And sure enough, police learn another heist has just gone down with a man in disguise. If Whiteman sticks to his M.O., he'll be back in Pembroke before the day is out. We've got a very, very good plan in place. He's going to come back to his uh, family, and he's going to carry all of the goodies with him when he comes back. Hours later, detectives spot Whiteman's girlfriend waiting for him at the airport. On the day of the takedown, uh, she was devastated. She just couldn't believe it. She was just in total denial. She said, no, you've got the wrong person. He's a businessman, he travels a lot, but he's not a robber. The proof is irrefutable. Whiteman has been caught red-handed. But detectives are surprised by his cool, unflappable demeanor, as if he's going to get away with everything. My gut feeling, well, in looking at him, there was something still missing in our investigation that he knew was missing. That's when police discover something very odd about Whiteman's past. There was no evidence of him existing prior to 1985. No birth certificates, no previous driver's licenses, no previous addresses. So it like he'd been parachuted into Pembroke. His prints are sent to Interpol, and police suspicions are confirmed. The name Robert Whiteman is an alias. He was then identified as Gilbert Galvin, an escapee from the United States. I went back, and uh, um, 
asked Mr. Galvin under that name uh, how he was doing, and the look in his eyes told me everything I needed to know. When he heard the name Galvin, he knew that he was done. Under his alias, Robert Whiteman, he could easily have been released on bail and then skip the country. Now that we knew he was Mr. Galvin, he was an American, he'd already fled a uh, institution down in the States, he was not gonna be getting bail. So any thought that he had that he was gonna be getting out was now gone. Three years before, Gilbert Galvin had escaped a Michigan prison where he was serving time for fraud. He headed for Ottawa and adopted the alias Robert Whiteman. As Whiteman, he started a new criminal career, robbing banks across the country. He always worked alone. Dressed as a businessman, Whiteman would charter a small plane from Pembroke and transfer to Air Canada at a larger airport. Guns packed in his luggage went from one hold to the other without ever being checked by security. Whiteman tells police he's soon tired of robbing banks. His average haul was less than five grand. Morning. Well, hello. Jewelry stores could give him much more. This is an exquisite piece. And even better, he admits, diamonds took his breath away. Thank you very much. But in order to rob jewelry stores, he needed to work with an accomplice. It was worth it. With a partner, Whiteman could scoop hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of diamonds in less than two minutes. His skills as a bandit were way above anything I had ever seen before. The fact that he would do these jobs right at noon, no getaway car, no running, just very, very calmly leave the job. I'm sure his heart was pounding, but uh, he kept it all together under control, but oftentimes see the police running. But Whiteman made one fatal mistake. He used an inexperienced accomplice at the Vancouver jewelry heist. And that accomplice left behind the only clue for police to follow, the shotgun found in the first hours of the investigation. In my mind, if he'd continued to operate alone, he might have continued for a long, long time before anybody caught uh, wind of what he was up to. In the end, Gilbert Galvin, AKA Robert Whiteman, is charged with 59 counts of armed robbery. Police try to bargain with him, give up the big man who undoubtedly moved the jewelry and Galvin will do less time but Galvin won't rat on the fence. It's not his style. For that bit of bravado, Gilbert Galvin is sentenced to 20 years in Canadian prison. I certainly respected Mr. Galvin. He was obviously very, very bright. And uh, he was, uh, it was quite a challenge to go after him. He didn't think very much of Canadian police, but now that we had him, he realized that uh, we were a lot smarter than he had initially given us credit for. And you could see there were, the respect was there, going both ways. The more than $2 million worth of cash and jewelry he stole has never been recovered. <laughs>